All right. Thanks everyone for joining. Looks like we uh, we got a very good crowd today. Probably our record breaking crowd <laughs> in terms of uh, number of attendees. Um, thanks again for joining today. We are we have uh, with us uh, Kirk uh, from the HP Labs, and uh, I'm delighted by by this. We have uh, been working with Kirk a couple of times already. He's a supporter of the HP developer community. That's great. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, quantum computing. And um, I will uh, I have to admit, I don't know anything about quantum computing. So I will let him uh, discuss that in just a few minutes. Before that, I'd like to introduce a couple of things that we do with this program. As I said, my name is uh, Didier. I'm the tech lead for the developer community. Um, we, we are running those um, programs to, uh, on, on a monthly basis. Uh, so the Munch and Learn, and this one is, is one of these Munch and Learn, more uh, geared toward uh, thought leadership and vendor and product agnostic. We already have an April Munch and Learn um, planned and uh, already available for you to register on uh, leveraging tech to address um, global challenges and health. And this is gonna be delivered by Fred Tan who's uh, working at the uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise Foundation. I think this is gonna be a, a really interesting uh, munch and learn for you. So please register to this. Um, my colleague, uh, Denis and Mathieu will um, dump all the links for you in the Q&A. Um, and uh, so you can uh, directly click on those uh, if you want. Uh, we have a second type of, uh, monthly, of sessions that we also run on a monthly basis called uh, meetups. And these are a little more in-depth on a particular technology or product. We have a, a session in March coming up on uh, delivered by Postman. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Postman and they're, they're doing a great job at providing a tool for experiencing, testing uh, APIs. And um, so they, they've been, they agreed to deliver a session for us on uh, showing some of the collaboration feature of, the, of their product. Uh, so this is going to be March 29th. And then in April, we have another session delivered by a gentleman from uh, ThoughtWorks on uh, the architecture that we call micro frontends. And uh, I think this is also a quite an interesting topic. It's think of it as um, a micro application or using containers, but apply to frontends and um, uh, web interfaces. So. Uh, this is April 26, and the register, registration links for both of these meetups are already available on our uh, meetup page, and uh, you, can, you can already uh, register. On top of this, uh, we do a couple of other things that you might find interesting. Um, one is called Workshops on Demand, and this is um, a catalog of workshops that you can use uh, to skill up, basically, and learn new things. Uh, we, we have 28 workshops as of today in the catalog. All of these use uh, Jupyter Notebooks to uh, deliver an experience. Uh, it's available 24 by seven for free and it's available to anyone over the internet. So take a look. We have, for example, workshops on um, learning Python, learning REST, uh, sorry, learning Rust. We have some sessions on using APIs, REST API. We have uh, workshops on um, Docker, on uh, Kubernetes, and many other uh, open source technology and uh, HP products. As always, this is a community, so we try to um, uh, get people involved and, and to engage with us. So we need you to amplify and contribute if possible. If you um, continue to join our talks, that would be uh, great. And also you can, don't hesitate to invite others to these talks if you feel there is a fit for them. Uh, friends, colleagues, university uh, students, customers, of course, we'd love to have our customers join these talks. Um, you can also invite and keep, uh, keep track of what we deliver through our monthly newsletter. We have a, a monthly newsletter that we send on the, the beginning of every month. Uh, you can sign up there. You can unregister in one click if you don't like it. Uh, we won't flood you with emails for sure. And we have a dedicated Slack in which you can engage to ask questions or answer questions from other community members on developer um, or data scientist um, questions or matter. So you can register to this Slack, slack.hpdev.io, and then check all this, the, the channels that we have there. 
We also have a Twitter if you're more like a Twitter person and we communicate on that channel as well. If you're an SME in a particular technology, we'd like to hear from you. For example, we have a huge part of our website, uh, developer.hp.com comes from uh, blogs, people reading our blogs. So if you want to contribute to one of these blogs, reach out to us. Um, we have a, a very easy content management system that is based on GitHub and Markdown. So it's pretty easy to contribute a new blog and go through a review process with us and uh, have a blog published in less than a week or so. Uh, we also deliver meetup, as I said. So if you are a subject matter expert, maybe we can build a, a meetup for, for that um, subject and uh, you can work with us on that. We could also use uh, this subject uh, at an event such as Discover or TSS or some of these events that we attend. And finally, if uh, you're an SME on a particular things that we don't have already in our catalog of workshops, we could jointly develop a new workshop on demand. So don't hesitate, reach out to us and um, contribute. That's the keyword. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, these are uh, kind of a QR code that you can get uh, on your phone for all the links. And um, I'll give you just one second for those who want to uh, scan that with a phone. And I'm going to hand it over to Kirk for the rest of the session. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good session. I'll stop share, Kirk, and you can share your desktop. Well, thank you very much, Didier. And then uh, I'm going to look forward to doing that uh, Rust tutorial because uh, I have uh, just started my own journey of, of learning Rust. I'm actually going back through, and we just had our, our HPE Code Wars, uh, you know, our 20th, uh, 20th? I think it's more than that. Uh, high school programming competition. So I'm using my, I'm the only one who still programs the solutions in C. Um, and uh, so I'm going to, I'm reprogramming all those in Rust as my tutorial path, but I can't wait to, to see what resources you have available as well. And, okay. and thank yeah, you for the actually, opportunity. The, um, the funny story about this Rust course is that it was built by some guys in the storage team and they they uh, built it for themselves and then they left it uh, for us in the, in the community. So that's an example of a great community work. That is awesome. Uh, so thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kirk Bresnicker. I'm the, the chief architect at, at Hewlett Packard Labs. And that means I get to look over um, all the technology portfolio, advanced research and development we have here at Labs. And also we get to you know, get to work outside. I get to work with uh, our global partners, academic partners. I get to be part of engagements like the World Economic Forum. And, and quantum is definitely an area where we need to have a lot of people bringing in their expertise in this community. And you know, quantum is fascinating. I mean, it has everything that a technologist or a business science writer would want. It's got spooky Einstein stuff. It's got a way to solve really demanding problems about energy and chemistry, you know, exactly the kind of solutions that we need right now. Um, but it's been interesting for me to be participating and, and I get to coordinate um, our quantum uh, engagement with a broad quantum community. It's not just computing, it's quantum telecommunications, it's quantum sensing as well. It's how do we harness the power of mechanical systems that exhibit quantum mechanical properties and we utilize those in at the individual level, not just utilize them, is we, we utilize quantum properties for every kind of semiconductor we've ever produced, but to use those individual mechanical systems and their quantum properties, how do we harness that uh, for purpose and to solve really interesting problems? And it is absolutely a technology problem. It is a research problem. It is also a policy problem. And so uh, we'll get into a little bit of that as well. But uh, just to begin to launch into our discussion today, and Didier, just to, for a time check, how long do I have and how much do we want to save for questions? Um, we will save questions to the end because you're alone as a panelist. Right. Um, um, I would say you have until the, the top of the hour, but let's keep 10 oh, minutes for, for questions. Perfect, great. So let's do this. So I just want to give you guys just one one little view into as as did I say uh, I'm, I'm from Hewlett Packard Labs and uh, and labs you know we always are constantly refreshing the the technology areas because what we need to prepare and enable uh, both inside the company and in communities like this one uh, is always going to change. Uh, but uh, so this is our current set of research and development areas within um, Hewlett Packard Labs, and you can see right at the top AI and quantum. And, uh, and I love that those two are together. Um, and they're together because we are looking 
uh, to contribute to these spaces in where we think we can add unique value. And in AI and quantum, both it is trying to understand how we take accelerated technology, acceleration technology, and integrate it into supercomputing and to have that hybrid heterogeneous computational portfolio. And then not only to have it, but have it really make a difference. And so it's, they both sit up there and, and we'll get into a little bit more about uh, why that is and, and how acceleration is really uh, taking shape here at Labs. But it ends up ringing around, right? And so it ends up having a definite impact in security and sustainability in network and distributed systems in our future systems ar architecture. Certainly we'll see uh, how photonics is factoring into that as well. And then it also comes back to silicon uh, as the way that we scale and make these things available. So we are up there at the, at the top of the hexagon here and talking about AI and quantum today. Uh, so, you know, as I said before, you know, the headlines keep coming. I get, uh, I get people uh, with our leadership team, my friends and my family, uh, they are sending me constantly, you know, did you see the headline? And with quantum, it is now this really, uh, really frothy mixture uh, both of of hype uh, and a fact check, uh, you know the case against quantum computing. Uh, you know, I on Q, uh, you know, more with quantum computer is a hoax, uh, and this one was particularly stinging since we were one of uh, the original uh, investors uh, in I on Q before they went public, and we're still very bullish on their technology and their capability. This particular uh, the expose was written by a short seller. Scorpion Capital with the expression you know, intent of, of trying to uh, to drive uh, some uncertainty into the stock price of one of the few quantum hardware companies that's actually made that transition to becoming a publicly traded company. Uh, quantum computing bubble, uh, quantum hype from reality. And I, and I like this one from the Financial Times, especially because that's certainly what I hope that we are helping to contribute to. You know, when our customers and our partners come and visit us at, um, at our uh, customer innovation centers. Uh, so when I was just out back in Houston this last week, and we were with about 250 of our partner chief technology officers from our partners and our customers in the U.S. public sector. Uh, you know, this was the question that kept coming up time and again, quantum, and it's it's the when and where question. It's when is this going to be an opportunity or a threat, or and where in my computational portfolio should I begin to prepare to take advantage. And, and the other thing that comes up after that also is, is how do I get started? How do we answer all these basic questions? And I think that's part of the challenge I think we have with quantum is right, right now, if you open up the quantum switch uh, pitch deck that you get from a quantum hardware company, you end up getting a slide that looks a lot like this one. And I, I, I removed the, uh, the information that's, that will allow you to identify this, but I drew this to scale. And so this is the kind of, of uh, graph you'll see inside the pitch deck from one of the quantum hardware companies. And, and you're looking at it at first glance, you're like, hey, I recognize this chart. This is a Moore's law uh, you know, exponentially scaling capability chart because it's got a nice graph uh, of bars that are going up. I love that. And it's got years along the bottom. I'm used to this. And, and, and it, it looks reminiscent. And I think it's essentially somewhat intentionally so. And then you look a little bit harder and you wait, wait a minute, this isn't quite a Moore's law graph because a Moore's law graph is how many transistors do I get per square uh, area of silicon? And I expect that to double just about every other year. And frankly, we're, we're on the tail end of that, of the second year is Moore's law scan. We'll get a bit that in a second, but uh, still it's been a tool, whether you were an engineer or a financier, it's been a tool for you to make reasoned not risk-free, but reasoned investments, investments of our own individual time uh, as individual innovators or investment of you know, national and multinational investment funds to invest in this. And that's what we expected. And, but the square mil number of transistors square millimeters, that has been so well understood for so long, it's a shortcut for all of us to understand about performance, about sustainability, about so many other really interesting figures of merit. And when we look at this graph, the problem is the only thing that we're seeing on this graph is the number of qubits. And that vertical axis is actually, it's not rich enough for us to make really good decisions. What we really need to know is, yeah, I absolutely have to know the number of qubits. That's going to come back in my algorithmic choices. I actually have to know a lot of other figures of merit, though. I need to know 
how quickly I can manipulate the, the qubits. I need to understand how long uh, they can remain in that uh, coherent state uh, when I when I combine all those qubits together. I need to know how richly these qubits can interact with each other. And I need to know what fidelity, what quality I should expect about these qubits so that that vertical axis is lacking a lot of dimensions. It's almost like when we when you when you think about string theory and they, they'll tell you, well, I know there are the four dimensions that you're used to, but there might be 10 or 12 more that are curled up and they might be really valuable when we get to these kind of quantum mechanical properties. Well, same thing here. We need to have a better vertical set of units. And it's probably not just one graph, it's probably many graphs. And I think that's the first challenge we have when we look at it at one of these slides. Then you look at the look at the dates along the bottom and you're like, okay. Year over year, I'm seeing improvement. And then you put up your hand in the back of the room. And you say, "Hey, can I ask you about 2025? I see there's a there's a little there's a little superscript there, and uh, it's and you look at the and you look at the tiny font, and it says breakthrough and error correction. And then you look at the at the other years, and it's like, oh, a breakthrough in integration. And that's the problem with the horizontal graph I'm seeing in so much from the quantum hardware community is it's not a time axis, even though it's labeled in years, it's really more of a of a breakthrough axis. It is talking about, uh, you know, that they are anticipating that they will have a success in a critical blocking factor that is going to impede the growth. And so when you add those two things together, that the vertical axis is not rich enough, that the horizontal axis is not actually a time axis, it's more about a milestone axis, uh, then it's it's harder. It's harder for us to make reasoned investments. Again, we're never looking at risk-free because if there's not risk, why would there be a reward? Uh, but it's really tough for us to make reasoned investments if this is the kind of information that we're getting from from the hardware community. And I think that's that's part of again what we're hoping that we're adding into the conversation. What can we do uh, to provide more uh, rigor, more understanding, more engineering? behind these graphs so that we can make more of those recent investments. And that's why I was calling this uh, this uh, talk, you know, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence, certainly, but extraordinary evidence demands extraordinary engineering. And so for me, that's really what we're trying to do. Can we wrap our head around what it takes to accomplish these levels of qubits and at a quality of all the figures of merit that will actually allow us to solve the problems? Uh, because what you see right after this slide uh, in the pitch deck is all the miraculous things that are going to happen. Great battery technology, fantastically efficient photovoltaic cells, fertilizers that we can create without resorting to fossil fuels. And then there's also a little bit, with all the wonders, there's also a little bit of fear. The fear that our, our existing public uh, key cryptography will be rendered useless uh, in the face of a quantum large insure factoring capability from Shor's algorithm. So those kinds of things coming together. So part of what we want to do in the conversation is understanding, you know, when, you know, back to that question, when and where, and, and aren't we on the cusp? And that was, this is a study. This was a, a, an extract you can see at the bottom, the archive preprint uh, link to this uh, work from Microsoft and ETH in Zurich. And they have gone back through, again, what do we expect these systems to do? You know, thank you, Professor Feynman. If we want to understand quantum dynamics, quantum chemistry, then, you know, that's what he told us. We needed a quantum system to do that. Uh, or we want to do factoring. We want to do that. We're really inter interested in that Shor's algorithm capability. And so this is a sensitivity analysis. And you can see that this is all the figures of merit you really need to understand in order to make that recent investment the qubit parameters and how many we'll need, how many qubits we'll need and how long will we have to run them. And it's interesting because if you look at the, the, the physical qubit um, required for these different really important algorithms, you'll see they're all denumerated in millions, millions of qubits. Uh, and then you look at the physical time, time, time and sometimes the physical runtime is short, uh, but it's all sometimes, especially for the integer factoring, it is still taking hours, days, or years. And I think it's really useful. And this is my friend, Doug Fink, who is one of the primary analysts at the Global Quantum Intelligence Report back at the Quantum to Business conference we had here in the Silicon Valley back in December. 
Doug did an important thing. I think it's 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 useful for me, to, at least to my, for me, to wrap my head around what we really mean by the number of qubits in the runtime here. And Doug posited that if if you could get a qubit um, a qubit second for a penny, uh, and right now that's that's actually significantly less than most of the cloud available qubit time that you can you can get. Uh, if you can get it for a penny, and if you multiply physical qubits times runtime then you get these numbers. And if you look at that first large integer factoring, that's $72 trillion. Uh, now, you know, we are used to over the last, you know, uh, 50 years of semiconductor processing and constant uh, improvement, we're used to knocking off zeros uh, on things. And it will give you even the example of the first human genome. The first human genome uh, cost $2.7 billion to sequence. And it was, you know, it wasn't necessarily a high quality sequencing. Now you can get a human genome sequenced overnight for about uh, $600. So we took something from a billion down to 600, you know, and, and that was uh, over the course of about 30 years. So we, we took off seven zeros in 30 years. Uh, you know, so seven to nine zeros in 20 to 30 years, that's a possibility. But in that case, that's going to go from $72 um, trillion dollars to $72 billion dollars and maybe we'll have you know take off some more zeros but at least for me for right now this is the kinds of the numbers that we should be thinking about in terms of when and and for the where's here are the these are the ones that we really care about and you probably have seen lots of um you know press over the really the last five years it's been accelerating about terms like quantum supremacy which is already sounds like kind of a problematic term by itself but Part of the challenge that we've seen is that the for the kinds of qubits we have, for the small counts we have, what they have been trying to, to demonstrate is can a quantum mechanical system a theoretical, a theoretically do a problem uh, that isn't possible to do in classical computing? Unfortunately, given these numbers here are in the millions and the number of qubits that we have in real quantum computers today, are in the tens to maybe hundreds, that means we have to choose a problem that fits within our available systems in order to explore their capabilities. And then if you go to the, the, um, the uh, theoretical quantum computer science teams and, and you ask them, what's a really hard problem that can fit within these constraints of the number of qubits we actually have? And they'll, they'll come up with a problem. Um, the challenge is it's not a problem that anyone is really interested to because they're not useful. They're just exponentially hard, anticipated to be exponentially hard for classical computing. And uh, you know, this is a case for us here at labs. Uh, last year, uh, there was some really fascinating work came out of the University of China doing the problem that was called the, uh, the Gaussian boson uh, sampling problem. And they built their bespoke photonic quantum mechanical system in order to do this calculation. Uh, they did it in a short number of hours, and their original estimate for this problem was that it would take 600 million years for a classical computer, supercomputer, to attack this problem. And uh, and one of our researchers here at Labs took that as a little bit a challenge in the best sense of science. Someone makes a claim, and you see if you can improve on that claim, if you can if, if you can add some accuracy uh, to that claim, and so. Uh, our researcher working with the Imperial College of London, uh, University of Bristol, the Cray, um, computer, uh, Cray uh, uh, supercomputing team. And together, they significantly improved the estimate of uh, 600 million years. And, and what they came up to was uh, about 70 days. And actually, that was before we launched the Frontier supercomputer. Um, that would be even less now on that, than that next exascale system. And it was a combination of improved supercomputing, but also it was that they brought some new algorithmic, classical algorithmic approaches to the problem. And it was the, the challenge that they actually had to not do what a perfect quantum computer could do. They were doing what today's quantum computers with its errors will do. And it's important when we think of quantum computers with errors because when a quantum computer has errors, it means it can't live up to the full potential. Every qubit can't interact with every other qubit. Every interaction isn't going to be perfect. Uh, that exponentiation we expect when, when one qubit is powerful, two qubits is two to the n, you know, two to the two, 
three qubits is two to the three, that exponential rise in capability we anticipate from these systems is, is, is muted because of the errors that are introduced. And so we can actually spoof that. And so we can spoof that efficiently. So all these things combine together uh, to mean that when we're starting from a problem that hasn't really been examined because the only thing we really know about it is it's extremely hard from a theoretical viewpoint, then we get to the practical examination of the problem. That's where those systems may still be ones where we can look to classic computing to provide advantage. Now, it, I fully expect that that Chinese team will come back and they will you know, rebuild their system larger and it will take more than 72 days. So they can continue to, to have them grow up, but at least for us, it was a measure that still we need to be in partnership. We need to have the classical side with all of our acceleration capabilities, constantly checking the work, providing that counterbalance, raising the bar on classical computing so we know how much higher the quantum uh, systems have to achieve in order for it to be worth an enterprise to adopt these technologies. So all these things I think are in the best sense of, of competitive scientific research uh, that I'm really proud that we've been able to participate. In. So this comes back to, I, I, I'm sure you've seen this cartoon, but I always, I always keep a copy of this on my desktop, but just to remind ourselves, uh, you know, when we're making robust claims, uh, we're making extraordinary claims, we do try need to try and be explicit. And for me, you know, what we really need to understand is for these quantum mechanical systems, and so we want to harness them for computation, what do we need to do to, in order to understand the technologies that we can bring to bear? What can we do from an engineering standpoint to make these real? And what is it actually going to be like over time? And that's where you know, it's useful for us to, to draw some lessons in history. And, and, and I, I put these up because, again, what we're seeing are things that look like Moore's law, exponential growth slides. Well, that means that we should be able to take some, some lessons from the semiconductor community. And in here, you can see on the left here, you know, that's the very first Bell Labs transistor, 1947. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is a little rough looking, isn't it? Uh, but it was just 10 years before we went from that very crude looking point contact transistor to the first nine volt transistor consumer radio, the Sony TR63. And it was also uh, only 11 years before the IBM 7070, the first application of transistors uh, in a commercial computer. So you can say, wow, only 10 years from this raw lab prototype at Bell Labs to consumer and enterprise production. Now, part of what made that possible is that for the 40 years before this, people had understood the power of a inverting amplifier because we had vacuum tube technology. And in some ways, the transistor could drop in to that vacuum tube design. And with the exception of the fact that you now had low voltage and low impedance as your characteristic of your, of your design, amplifier design, as opposed to the high impedance, high voltage we had with vacuum tubes, there was already a community who understood. We understood the power of this capability. And this is where we don't necessarily have that same understanding with the quantum technologies. Uh, we, there's not that equivalent of this you know, pocket radio where just a couple of transistors replacing a couple of vacuum tubes suddenly opened up a new consumer category or the hundreds of transistors replacing the hundreds of vacuum tubes. And that size, weight, power, reliability improvement from the transistor uh, was really phenomenal. And also, the community decided um, they could have made those transistors way more expensive than vacuum tubes and still made money, but the community decided to really push this down. That's why we were able to have both consumer and commercial enterprise utilization of transistors simultaneously, because the cost reduction that was in these 10 years from that first cloud transistor to these was something the community decided to take on. You know, you go from this and, you know, another, another 20 years or another 10 years after this and Gordon Moore, you know, established the curve for integrated circuits, integrating those transistors together. And really, that's really what we embarked on. And I guess that's the other piece of this. We want to think about this. When we think about this, so often we think about quantum computing, it's a replacement. And it's a replacement for exactly what we have today. But again, I don't think that's a true analogy. What we really need to think about is something closer to this. And uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the, uh, with the, uh, the acronyms, EDVAC, was von Neumann's paper. If you've never read this paper, it's super accessible. It's not very long. 
And even though it was vacuum tube technology, read this paper and you will see everything you think about as a microprocessor is described in von Neumann's 1944 EDVAC paper. Uh, but that was still the theoretical. We weren't really realizing that full general purpose architecture, even with the vacuum tubes. This is from RAMAC, which is uh, from IBM. And you can see the lines that you see on this are not just the flow of computer uh, information theoretically through this, through this set of devices that are shown in this diagram. Those were actual patch cords that you had to plug in. You plug, you program this computer, one with punch cards, yes, but also that was just the data. You plug the flow of the of the information through by having cables run from block to block inside of this environment. So this is a, you know, in some ways, it's more of a bespoke environment. I had to create the wiring diagram of this computer new for every problem, and then also craft the data that flowed into it. It still, however, was so much more efficient than the traditional human-driven laborious process. And part of what we believe here at Hewlett Packard Labs is this is probably closer to the era we are for quantum. We can probably imagine advantage in these kinds of environments if we say, you know what, we might get to general purpose, we might get to those millions of qubits ready for any of those tasks we saw in that ETH and Microsoft sensitivity analysis, Quantum chemistry, yes. Quantum dynamics, yes. Large integer packaging, yes. Maybe even some quantum machine learning uh, algorithms, yes. But we probably are closer to this, that we need to understand how we take the qubits we actually have, combine them with supercomputing, combine them with AI acceleration, and come up with some of these bespoke hybrid environments. And that's where, you know, again, thinking about where we are in the history, I think is useful. And I think this is the other thing I'll, I'll throw up a uh, a uh, a uh, recommendation for a community that I'm part of, and that is oh, I still have to fix the slice. IRDS dot I triple E not double E dot org. This is the International Roadmap for Devices and Systems, and this is you know this is the Moore's Law community, and this is a team, and you can see at the bottom NTRS, ITRS, RTRS 2.0, IRDS. This is the succession of industry and um, academic and government roadmaps that the community has created you know, since the 70s, since Moore's Law, all the way to today, understanding how we predict, predict from the engineering requirements, predict from the academic uh, curriculum development, predict from the global and industrial investments, how we have scaled semiconductors. And you can see the dates here where we're just about uh, at the end of the, uh, the second era of Moore's Law scaling. The first one is that Gordon understood the uh, geometric standard, just making the transistor smaller. Now we're in equivalent scaling where we push the transistors closer, but they don't run any faster. They don't use any less power than they did before. And maybe we'll get to, it's an if, not a when, we figure out 3D power scaling for logic. We already have it from, for, for memories. Uh, but again, for me, part of what we want to understand as we learn from history, how do we apply the systematic road mapping of technologies and then finding those blocking challenges, doing academic research leading into industrial scale, leading into commercial production, because every one of the times we switched from geometric scaling to equivalent scaling, equivalent scaling as we now look to 3D scaling, we've had to solve really, really hard engineering problems. And the way we did it was as a global community. And that's why it's the ITRS, the IRDS, the international community. And it's also a pre-competitive community. These are the teams that start with academic research that then is brought up inside between uh, in industry consortiums. Then we get to the commercial part where we, we scale and, and we compete uh, very vigorously. Uh, but you know, part of what I'm also not seeing as we look at quantum uh, right now is necessarily that same international cooperative model. So hoping, hoping again to, to try and bring these lessons and bring them forward to this community. So this is actually where we think um, we can, we're trying to steer our conversations with, uh, with the quantum technology communities is right now people are on the left. They're taking their qubit and, you know, there's a half a different, half a dozen different kinds of qubits. There's photonic qubits, there's, there's trapped ions, there's neutral atoms, uh, there's, uh, there is all of the superconducting qubits like you might've seen at uh, Google and IBM, there are still people doing the same work that Ray Bosley and his team did 10 years ago, the nitrogen uh, vacancy qubits. Uh, and so there's lots of different kinds of qubits. And right now they're all trying to, to build 
build more qubits, build better qubits. That was that graph we saw. And they're working their way up. And eventually they hope to get to a fault tolerant, um, you know, a uh, highly uh, error corrected uh, fault tolerant um, quantum computer. And then they'll ask what problem do you want to solve on? And we really, again, think that we are much more likely to see advantage, enterprise advantage, scientific and engineering advantage, if we start with the left, I mean, sorry, start with the right on the green side, start with what the problem you want to do from the problem that's really useful and then build the architectures for those algorithms, that bespoke environment. Work out in simulation and emulation and do those analysis in the supercomputing capabilities we have today to get down to where the gates are, to get down to the controllers and how you actually physically manipulate these systems and then realize the design. So tops down is where we think is probably much more likely to be beneficial. And one of the things that really comes through, if you really embrace that, that holistic co-design to say, you know what, this is going to be quantum. Yeah, there's going to be some, there's going to be quantum accelerators. There's going to be AI accelerators. There's going to be classical supercomputing. I'm going to have to move around a tremendous amount of information and even how much information, you know, one of the questions I frequently ask the quantum hardware companies is say, as I look at your roadmap, as you increase the number of qubits, can you tell me how many floating point operations it will take to manipulate each of those gates, so each one of those quantum uh, gates, how many bytes will I have to transmit into or out of the quantum system? How many flops, how many bytes per second? What is that like? And, and right now that's a tough question for them to answer. They can look at it today, but today's systems are much more about a very small number of qubits controlled with test and measurement systems. So they haven't really gotten to that, that level of industrialization. But what I really want to understand and what we're hoping to contribute is, is how do we integrate quantum into the supercomputer? And we have to think about three different levels of integration. The first level we have to think about is the physical integration. And here we're talking about the fact that right now, if I want to create a quantum computer, really what I'm doing is I'm creating a little pocket universe. I am creating a, a space that is completely isolated from the rest of the universe because we have to quiesce. We have to have the system that's inside of that, that space be unaffected by the rest of the material universe. And I want to put this, this mechanical system in there with quantum properties that I can individually control and manipulate. And sometimes that means it has to be in an ultra hard vacuum. Sometimes that means it has to be fueled down to millikelvin, uh, sub millikelvin uh, temperatures. Sometimes it means it has to be isolated from any possible source of mechanical vibration. And that's, it's one thing to have that happen in the laboratory. And we can imagine having that. It's another thing for imagine that happening in the data center. You know, where do I back the helium truck up to, to super cool the doer that is inside of, uh, that's going to keep my superconducting qubits at millikelvins? Uh, how am I going to do that effectively? How am I going to do it safely? Uh, what is that change inside the computational environment when we have these novel, novel mechanical systems, quantum mechanical systems that we need to be able to harness? The second question we have to ask is, is the cyber physical integration. So when I am manipulating a quantum uh, computer, I'm often striking my, my qubit with a, a microwave, a perfectly shaped microwave pulse, or maybe I'm hitting it with a laser pulse, or maybe I'm manipulating an electromagnetic field. Um, I'm gating uh, a, photonic, uh, a photonic resource. All of that is active analog control. So that's the question of how do I actually manipulate this system? How do I take my digital control at the large level and have it be a analog mechanical, electromechanical manipulation of the, of the quantum system at the quantum mechanical level? And then what does it take in terms of that control system? What is the timing of those control loops? How much computation do I need to have AI accelerators, which are showing tremendous progress in controlling really complicated dynamic systems. Well, that AI, that, that error correction, the quantum mechanical system might be just what we could apply these AI accelerators to, but, but then how do I feed that AI accelerator with all the information and control and data that it needs? And how do I interconnect that when we're, as you saw in that, that diagram, when we're picking about millions of qubits and today we have dozens. And the final piece we need to understand about integration is productivity. Because as we look to the next generation of scientists who want to do 
uh, you know, that scientific research. What they understand is Jupyter notebooks and they understand Python. Uh, they don't even understand necessarily many of them uh, traditional supercomputing. We've already had, we're already having to bridge into from Python to supercomputing. Now we have to bridge into Python, into quantum and neuromorphic and heterogeneous accelerated supercomputing. Or maybe they're a cybersecurity prof prof professional. You know, they want to see that, you know, the next tool, they want to see it attached to Excel. Uh, they want to see that spreadsheet or you are a, an operations uh, leader and you want to have your tool and you want to have it connected because it doesn't matter how efficient our accelerator is. If we can't connect it efficiently to the people who have actual application development needs, then it's not going to help us. It's, we're not going to we're not going to improve the outcomes in a time that matters. We have to be able to make it integrated at the productivity level. So thinking of those three things, uh, and we think of what we've done in the past. And so, Cerebrus, the wafer scale uh, AI accelerator, uh, is one of our our partners, and they created a tremendous engine, hundreds of thousands of of AI accelerators, uh, gigabytes of memory, incredible capabilities, but how do you feed it? And in this case, uh, what we had to do was we had to take our Superdome Flex systems, 48 terabytes of memory, 32 Xeon sockets, 200 terabytes of raw flash, Ethernet feeding all of these wafer scale accelerators, uh, Infiniband and, and a massive file system. That's how you actually got performance, the, the, the efficiency that was possible in a wafer scale accelerator. And by the way, each one of those wafers consumes 22 kilowatts of of power at one volt running through a 300 millimeter uh, wide piece of silicon. Uh, incredible engineering at the small scale, at the, at, the, at the wafer scale, but you had to plummet up uh, throughout the system. And, and this was the original uh, PS1 system that we did at Pittsburgh Supercomputing. Uh, we just have uh, replicated the same thing. And again, a Cerebus CS2 system uh, put into LRZ uh, in Germany, and we still needed it. We still needed to surround that super efficient accelerator with a, a relatively unique style of system to feed it. And as we look for the exponential increase in potential in quantum, we want to know what is it like, you know, to integrate that together. In terms of the productivity team, and this is where I'm partnering very closely with our Cray programming environment team. And right now, this is what the Cray team is taking on. They have the Cray programming environment, that environment that we have crafted and curated over decades to attach science and engineering into supercomputing. But also there's the AMD environment. We support that. There's the Intel environment. We support that. There's the NVIDIA environment. We support that. And of course, there's the GNU, the open environment. We support that. As we look to all the AI accelerators, all the possible quantum uh, QPU accelerators, what we can't really have happen is to have another dozen of these verticals. Uh, we need to understand how we treat these as a category. Uh, and so really what we're working with the Cray Programming Environment Team is, can we talk about an AI framework? Can we talk about a quantum ecosystem compiler collection so, so we have those as just two more stacks that we add up? Uh, and can we treat all of those as, each one of those as, as a new class of accelerators? And you can see the line at the bottom also, we also want to understand, hey, uh, in terms of those, uh, actually, let's click one more touch, oh, there, that was it. Um, you know, in terms of those, can we underpin those existing science and math libraries, and I should have highlighted this a little bit better, but those heterogeneous computing extended scientific and math libraries, can I underpin today's libraries, today's library calls with accelerated technology? Again, looking for as many ways as possible to bridge these accelerations into today's codes and make it available to today's application development team. So when I think of all the things that we're doing at labs to engage the quantum community, it really goes into these three buckets. And also highlight again at the bottom, this isn't just about labs. It's about labs and our HPC AI business group and my partners at the Cray Programming Team, for example. It's also about our innovation partners. Internally, that's our Pathfinder. So we have our we have our Hewlett Packard Enterprise Venture Fund uh, Pathfinder and uh, and the quantum investment team, Todd Poole and the investment team there. And, and we have each other on speed dial and Slack. Uh, because we're constantly looking both inside and the outside of the company, how do we coordinate Pathfinder investments with labs innovation? And also we work with our government affairs team, whether it's in the US, in Europe, and our allies in, in Asia, our government affairs teams are constantly having and, and bringing us into conversations and we're adding into the conversations that they've already started 
because quantum is definitely uh, an area of policy and investment. And just so people get their heads wrapped around it, right now we anticipate that the investment in the quantum sector will be about $55 billion this year. So that's a lot of money flowing into uh, this technology sector overall. And uh, right now it also looks that, yeah, but maybe estimates are maybe about half of that is actually going in China. So uh, the, the, te the teams in China are definitely getting a lot of support. And I think we'll see that same kind of support mirrored here in the US as well as in, in the rest of Asia and in Europe. But what we're, do what we're doing in labs is looking at those three buckets. I already talked about the first one, the unified workflow environment. How can we treat all the accelerators? So you can see we have the quantum on the green there. It's slotting into that supercomputer alongside the AI accelerators, the neuromorphic accelerators, the analog accelerators, the FPGAs, the GPUs, the CPUs. We really see that's that bespoke hybrid environment. So that's what we want to do in, in the first bucket, the unified workflow environment. The second is quantum inspired accelerators. And this is, this is for me is, is interesting because it's full circle. So as I said earlier, Ray Bosley and his team, they were looking at qubits 10 years ago. Uh, they, uh, they stopped that work uh, of their own accord. They pivoted, became our large scale integrated photonics team. Um, they have now come full circle because now having designed the micro ring resonators, the, uh, the, uh, these mock sender inferometers, the, the grading couplers to get the photons into and out of those, uh, those silicon photonic elements, they're actually now utilizing this not for communications, which was the earlier purpose, but they're expanding off to computation. And in some of the very same uh, problem areas where we have anticipated, but have not demonstrated quantum acceleration, uh, but they're using classical physics. So they're using photonics, but not the quantum mechanical behavior of a photon. They're using the classical physical behavior of, of a photon, the in interference uh, of the wave and the particle nature of the photon harnessed uh, for doing, compu <coughs> doing computation. So we're doing this, excuse me, take a second here. We're doing this not as a hedge against quantum, but as a parallel effort. Because in the end, what I want to be able to do is attach enterprise customers, engineering science workloads to accelerated, accelerated computation in a hybrid uh, supercomputing, uh, heterogeneous supercomputing environment. And if I'm going to learn more about doing that from a quantum inspired accelerator from Ray and his team, I'm going to, I'm going to learn as much as possible as, as soon as possible. And if I learn it from one of our quantum hardware partners, that's great too. And then that will inform Ray and his team. And that will, whoever's leading first, sometimes you know, they're the, the front of the Peloton. They've got the hardest, uh, hardest job to pedal, uh, but you know, they're making a pathway for everyone. And I think that's why we, we, we're, we're operating these, these quantum inspired and quantum uh, investigations in parallel. The last piece is uh, that large scale quantum stimulation. We've just delivered the exascale I you know, was at uh, Argonne National Labs uh, two weeks ago and seeing as they're turning on the second exascale machine. And then we'll look forward to, uh, to uh, from, from Frontier to Aurora and then on to El Capitan uh, at, uh, at Lawrence. We have this incredible simulation capability. And what we want to do is to utilize this to bring that simulation capability to improve the engineering of quantum systems. And again, especially, again, that engineering of hybrid bespoke quantum classical accelerated um, heterogeneous compute systems. So we have the ability to, to simulate and especially simulate the kinds of qubits we actually have, uh, as opposed to uh, the ones that we might yearn for in the future, because the more errors there are in a qubit, the easier it is to spoof it and to simulate it efficiently. So let's simulate and actually learn about what it would be like to operate the kinds of noisy intermediate uh, scale quantum uh, devices we have today as accelerators inside of classical supercomputing. We can simulate that. We can learn about it. We can actually better inform the quantum hardware development teams for the five figures of merit that you have, all those columns that we saw in that microtoff and in ETHC sensitivity analysis. Hey, for, for this particular quantum chemistry problem, you should work on that the figure of merit, improve the fidelity. Don't worry about you know, that interconnection. Uh, this problem doesn't require that. And as we look at the, the diversity of, um, of 
quantum approaches, it might be the fact that just as in the very first PA risk uh, processor board I designed here at HP in the early 90s, I had five different semiconductor logic families on that, on that uh, single processor board. We might utilize multiple quantum, multiple AI accelerators to, to negotiate exactly just one problem, because that's where we are. We're in this bespoke environment where we need to have this hybrid approach. So we think that large scale quantum simulation can help us to design, to simulate, to analyze and determine if there is advantage in creating this hybrid environment. And then when you're all done, essentially what you've done is, is create a digital twin of the bespoke hybrid environment. And then when you're done, you actually have the control system to run that uh, that bespoke hybrid environment. So these are the areas that we are really looking at in, in terms of labs. And then I think Didier, I'm, I'm getting close to the top of the hour. So I think I'll just show one more slide or two, just to tease in a little bit more you know, about the labs, about the quantum inspired accelerators. Uh, because again, this, these slides look should look the same, you know, uh, because we're treating the quantum developments and the accelerated development, and some of that's the AI development, uh, some of that is the quantum as far development. We're treating them all together because we really think that's where there is real uh, synergistic potential that, that as we treat these all as accelerators and we work on the, the workflows and we work on the productivity and connecting all of you in this development community to the great efficiencies you'll have here, sometimes because you want to get way down and, and directly manipulate these systems, but others of you may not care at all about how it works. You just want to have your, ask, your answers sooner for a lower energy cost, a more sustainable, a more equitable solution. And so that's why we're looking at all these together. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'll stop and see uh, if there are questions and we can open up to, to the community here. Uh, but I'll leave you with leave a little bit more of that. And again, for me, when you saw that, that, that hexagon I showed at the beginning, you saw the AI and the quantum together. And for me, that's actually a deep relationship. I actually think we might need to use AI in order to control these very dynamic cyber physical systems that will be a quantum uh, computer. I might think that we will see this partnership uh, and also that as we begin to make accelerated technologies more available to all of you, we're making it easier for you too, so that you can use whichever of these devices use the best solution, the most sustainable solution, the most equitable solution possible. Thank you, Clark. You might want to take a look at the Q&A uh, box. I don't know if you can see that on your system. So is that in the chat or is that in a different there, box? Let's start with the Q&A right now. There's three questions in the Q&A. Oh, now I see it. Sorry, I okay. found the Q&A box. Yep. And while uh, you look at that, I'll, I'll start the, the poll for the end of session, uh, but don't-, sure. don't Okay, so the first question uh, from Tim was, you know, IBM, Google, Microsoft all have public quantum offerings. Uh, does or will HP, oh, there, the poll just covered up my Q&A, so I'll move that away. Uh, do, do we have any public visibility around quantum computing? Uh, you know, we don't have anything right now. Uh, as I said, uh, we're not planning on um, restarting our, our low-level quantum hardware work. Uh, what we're looking at is to partner there. Uh, but you know, I think uh, we're really working hard and actually just have uh, just hired someone. She's, uh, someone she accepted today, so I'm very happy. I've got another resource to bring uh, into this. Specifically, looking to bridge that the gap uh, from the quantum software and the quantum engineering communities into our supercomputing capabilities. So I think that's where you'll see us uh, again contribute materially first is in, hey, you know, what is it like to run a, uh, a quantum simulation on the world's highest performing supercomputer, the top 500 number one system? What is it like and, and how do we bridge that gap? How do we take these this community and move them in so that we can advance forward? It's been really interesting to me as I've talked to the quantum software development communities, I say, hey, well, uh, have you ever tried running this on, on a cluster? And they're like, well, no, I, I use the GPU in my laptop and maybe I've used a couple of GPUs on, on a cloud service, but they've never really taken that opportunity uh, to leap over into a really, a true high performance computing, supercomputing model. Uh, and so that is where I think what we're really looking to try and, and make some of those, uh, make some of those contributions uh, first, uh, as we continue to to find and seek out partners, uh, and not just not just partners, but partners uh, in a broader sense of, of a larger tent, 
quantum hardware company, a national lab, I think that's where you might see us get involved uh, uh, next. So the next question is, uh, among the quantum uh, computing modalities, uh, which one uh, is, H is HP investing uh, in? And the answer is, we're not picking one. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a line, uh, the opening uh, line of, of uh, Tolstoy, Anna Karenina, is uh, all happy families are identical and all unhappy families are unique in their misery. And right now, if you look at all the all the hybrid, all the quantum modality approaches, the 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 neutral atom, the the trapped ion, the photonic, the superconducting, the nitrogen vacancies, um, they all have pluses, they all have minuses. You know, some of them have great coherence times. You can entangle these qubits and come back, you know, you know, seconds, minutes later, they're still right where they left them. The problem is that their manipulation time is extremely long. Or they'll have uh, they're super fast and they decohere really almost as quickly, and their error rate is too high. So there isn't just one. Uh, so we're not going to bet on one, uh, and we really want to make that an open uh, opportunity. And again, because we want to take each according to its advantages and use it where we think it's it's best, because we're not anticipating that that general purple idealized error corrected at the millions of qubit scale uh, is something we're likely to see uh, very soon. We want to know: can we take each one of them and make use each one according to its particular principles? You know, again, back to my analogy of when I designed that first system, I used ECL for the clocks. I used it was our very first CMOS PA RIS processor. Uh, we still had lots of TTL on that uh, on that board because each one had an advantage and a disadvantage, a cost, a power, uh, a uh, capability, and so understanding how we use each one is going to be uh, is going to be important. And I think that's really where again we want to bring them in into the simulation capability. You know, the the slide I was showing here uh, prior that large scale simulation capability. I think giving and providing that. Uh, as a resource into the community, uh, I think will be a very valuable thing so that people can begin to plug in working from the top down, from the algorithm down to the actual uh, qubits we have rather than a theoretical improvement at some point after some number of breakthroughs. I think that's likely to provide more advantage sooner. Uh, let's see, and then we got one more question. Of, uh, Oh, someone's asking for uh, as uh, for a short. Uh, a sh a sh a sh I can't. I can't tell John if you want to have this be one short topic, a uh, three or four or five to thirty. Oh, oh, three, four or five. They were like uh, expounding on each one of these. And oh, absolutely. Each one of these. Uh, each one of these points uh, definitely merits a longer discussion. Uh, and uh, I think that would be a, a fantastic thing. And, you know, uh, as far as that, if any of you are interested in following up with this, you know, DDA is going to make this, this available. Uh, this is, again, a conversation we're having out loud. And I guess one last thing, and I didn't touch on it earlier, but, uh, you know, when we think of crypto, uh, or maybe I did, I can't remember, but, um, you know, the most real thing that's going to happen in quantum in the next two years is the approval by NIST here in the United States of the post-quantum cryptography standard algorithm recommendations. And that's already a big deal. Uh, what makes it an even bigger deal is if those become adopted as a federal information processing standards, uh, the FIPS standards, uh, and because those inform regulation. And that will say, if you're in a highly regulated industry like healthcare or banking, you may need to swap out and adopt new replacements for public uh, key cryptography. Uh, and I see like, we got a comment here that our question yet, uh, are the CTOs tracking all the FIPS and, and standards? Absolutely. Uh, and we've been having that, I know internally, we've been having that conversation and actually one of the most rewarding uh, conversations I've been part of at the World Economic Forum, the cybersecurity practice and the quantum development network, we've been working together as a working group over the last two years and we're just about to start up the next two years and we're trying to precisely be in that intersectional space, which is between enterprise and the security demands, the cybersecurity demands, and the quantum community. What do we need to have a conversation with a board member about? What do we need to have inside of the, the CISO organization uh, in order for us to, to train the team so we can have that intelligent discussion? 
And one of the most positive, because for me, it's not just about the expense we'll all suffer as people have to swap out crypto standards one for another, and that's the real cost, uh, especially for you know for financial sector and healthcare. And we know who that we end up paying. We end up as a community all paying for that. But there's also the positive side to me, and that is cause because it's provoking a conversation inside of cybersecurity about uh, having a robust cryptographic supply chain. Uh, and so if nothing else, then it's it's having those really good conversations happening. And so I think that's one of the the beneficial uh, beneficial uh, outcomes of this, even though we don't know when that uh, when that that day will be when quantum will be able to tackle an RSA. 2048 or an AES 256, uh, understanding uh, that it could happen, uh, and that it's for, it's a it's a, a point of fragility that we probably should have examined anyways, because there are other ways to attack a cryptographic supply chain other than brute force, uh, attacking the people behind the chain, attacking the intermediate stages, uh, attacking more of that supply chain rather than the, the actual cryptographic number itself. Uh, you know that's a, that's a useful conversation. So we had a question here. You know, could we guess when a functioning accelerator will be able for commercial use? And you know, there definitely there are the the, the small scale systems are definitely available. You know, you can get them as we had earlier. You saw uh, there are systems that are on on the cloud now, and you can get either simulated time uh, or actually access to the physical systems. The challenge is it's still just those individual systems. There's not necessarily what you need to put around it to do something uh, something that we really have meaningful. Yeah, so I think there, there's that. Um, do we have recommendations of book or learning quantum computing as a computer science graduate? You know, here I do not, but uh, I, Debbie, Diddy, I'll have to get you this link afterwards. Uh, we did a, we did a, I did a co-presentation of the same material, but with, um, with uh, some academics uh, at the IEEE uh, Silicon Valley uh, uh, sessions uh, about a couple months ago, and so I think that was there was a really good uh, video that was there about. You know how should the how should today's computer scientists begin to think about the capabilities of, of quantum? And, and here I'm not talking about the abstract capabilities, but in the same way, I think we all, even if you even if you don't, you know, draw out a logic diagram of and and or gates, um, as a computer scientist, you at least you understand you know Boolean algebra. You understand ifs and ands and ors and uh, and negating, and you understand how to craft. Uh, you know, a logical expression. Um, and with quantum, you know, sampling a probability distribution of uh, entangled gates is just a different kind of arithmetic and mental thinking. And that's where uh, I think there's there's still a lot of work to be done with beginning to, to get that together. And I think part of what we see the challenge and, you know, we had, we had the genius of source algorithm and here's this one individual and he made that leap when he realized that the quantum Fourier transform would expose a periodicity that could be harnessed in order to determine if a number is uh, is factorable and then what the factors are, um, you know. But that was you know that was one genius. How do we actually raise the capability of the entire committee to explore algorithmic potential on problems we care about uh, with with quantum as its underpinning? I think that is still something that. Uh, needs to emerge. I think it's a lot of work that still has to happen there. Uh, so here's a question uh, about, is there a cost that shows the total energy cost, including the cost of producing each thing, the, the helium and, and nitrogen quantum computing versus, and, uh, and Richard, uh, I think you're, I asked this exact same question, which is for me, that total, that total energy envelope. Uh, if it takes, you know, how many, back to the questions of how many uh, flops per qubit, if it's a, a petaflop per qubit, great. Uh, if it's an exaflop for qubit, not so great. Uh, you know, when we design these systems, understanding that whole design envelope, uh, and what does it take to, you know, to create the cyber physical control system, to manipulate the quantum system, to get the data into and out of the of the quantum realm back into the data center realm, and accounting for all the costs, the time cost and the energy cost. Um, I have not seen that uh, that kind of analysis. Although I do know that uh, that we have a, at least one team here at Labs that uh, was just proposing this as a paper uh, for the uh, for the Cray Users Group meeting that's coming up. So uh, maybe if that gets published, uh, we'll have the answer to Richard's question uh, from the team here at Labs. 
All right. Uh, the the next think, question. Uh, I, yeah. I think we we gotta stop at some point. Oh. Uh, there's a lot oh. of questions in the in the chat as well. I'll try to relate oh, okay. those to you. Maybe we can take those offline. Um, sure. Thank you uh, very much for for your session. Thank you everyone for sticking with us. Uh, we know we are late. Uh, thanks right. again everyone for joining. Thanks for uh, for the session, and we'll talk to you next month. Thank you very much everyone. Thanks for your time, everyone. Bye bye.